Are you ready to think big and act bold? Then you are in the right place. This is Innovative Entrepreneurs, a podcast that will bring you the stories, insights, and tips from some of the most successful and innovative entrepreneurs in the world. I am your host, Erica Bailey, and I am here to help you start, scale, and sustain your own entrepreneurial journey. Let's get started. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Mr. Justin Maxwell. Justin has a unique background. As an ex-school teacher who felt the urge to do more and think bigger in 2017, he followed his passion and created a system of maximizing impact and helping others align their money, life, and legacy with and purpose. He is also a loving husband and father of three boys. Justin helps entrepreneurs and professionals create financial certainty and live their biggest life by using alternative strategies. The goal is not to reach an end goal, rather to create a life that has money working, but the focus and energy is on things that really matter. Justin, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. I'm really excited to be here. Appreciate it. No problem. We are happy to have you on. So Justin, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and maybe about your business? So I am from Salt Lake, lived in Salt Lake pretty much my entire life. I have a small, I guess it's a biggish family when you compare it to most people. I have three children. I have a beautiful wife. We have two very large dogs and I now help people use financial systems, use a different philosophy around the way they approach money so that they can maximize and experience the biggest, best life they possibly can. Um, it's a little bit different approach when it comes to money than a typical financial advisor, but I, mm-hmm. I do feel that it's a it's a great opportunity for people to maximize their situation and just to think a little bit differently around the way they're approaching their entire life, but allow money to to drive that. And so that's that's our approach. Wow, that's pretty cool. So you went from a school teacher to an entrepreneur. It's interesting. We had a conversation with another person who did the exact same thing. So why did you decide to go into business for yourself? And I guess, what was your why? Yeah. So I think it's important to know that I chose teaching just because I didn't know what else to do. It was almost the safe avenue for me. Uh, I always, like I always excelled in school. Like I never really thought, you know what, the there's business out there. There's other things for me. It was, I'm good at school. I really don't know what else to do. I like sports because I, I was a physical education teacher. And I'm just going to be a teacher. I'll just work my way up the ranks and I'll probably eventually end up <clears throat> teaching college somewhere. Like that was my mindset. I didn't have any other real desires oh, yeah. or even like a vision that there was other things out there for me because I didn't know, like I was exposed to those things. My family was very much get good grades, study and do this. And it kind of drove me into that world because honestly, not to be offensive to people that did well in school because I did well in school. That's kind of what you're good at. And you really like that doesn't translate to success elsewhere. And so you oftentimes don't feel like you can find success elsewhere. So for me, like I'm just going to stay in education because that's where I'm, I'm thriving. So that was, that was my mindset. It wasn't until someone put in my mind that there was something bigger and better for me and gave me a vision or a possibility of a future that was bigger than what I had projected that I actually realized, you know what, I can do something else and I can take the skills that I've developed through the education process and take these to the world and make a bigger impact and make more money and be abundant. And so it was that vision or that possibility of a future self that inspired me to leave teaching. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's once you create that, why, once you capture that, why and encapsulate that, why, I don't even know if I said that word, right. Um, it really does drive, you know what I mean? It drives you to to create your dreams, to live your life by design. And it's, it's powerful. I mean, I really think that somewhere inside of us, we all know that we are destined for more. But like you said, it, it's hard to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? So, you know, starting in a, in a W-9 position, that's because you're, that's what you're comfortable with. So taking that leap and getting uncomfortable, look at where you are now. I mean, that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. No, I, I really resonate with what you just said there. It's just, to me, it's not that people don't want to take risk. It's just that they can't see themselves in the future with anything different. They don't realize the possibilities that are out there 
And so once you can put yourself into the future self and see that it's possible, well, I think a lot more people, if they could see that vision, would take a lot more action. It's just they can't see themselves. They're seen in the day-to-day drudgery of this is working. I'm getting, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm living, I'm moving along. But until you look to the future and have a vision of what is possible, that's when I think action happens. And I think that's what excites people. Wow. Very good. So can you tell us about Big Life Financial and, and what inspired you really to, to do this kind of business? Yeah. So when I caught that vision, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like when I, I heard someone speak and it just put the possibility in my life and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I tried all sorts of stuff. I was still teaching. I didn't like jump immediately and just I'm right off because I, I'd been in school for, I mean, I have a master's degree. Like I was pursue, I was almost about to pursue my PhD. I couldn't just like go back to that lifestyle for my family because they had endured seven years of and no income. income. So I stuck with teaching and I did it, but I was looking for things all like on the side, things that I could do. So I did everything from sales to real estate to most of it was in real estate. Yeah. Real estate is like the big compass word, right? And all sorts of stuff within real estate. I did s- seller finance notes. I did flip fixing and flipping. I did like short-term rental things. Like I did all sorts of just random things trying to just chase money. Okay. And it wasn't until I realized that I need to be aligning what I'm good at and finding something that I can actually produce and don't just chase the money, but create something that it actually led to me getting to where I am now. And so happenstance led me to my business partner who started Big Life Financial before we met. And then it just so happened that we gelled really well and we took off and ran from from there. So that's how we started. He had already started Big Life Financial, but it was in alignment with what I was looking for, for that bigger life, because that's what I wanted to bring to people is the bigger vision that they can reach some future spot that is far bigger and far more impressive than they could ever imagine. And that's what Big Life Financial is about. And so my business partner started it and I joined the, the wow. team in 2019. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations. How fantastic is it that you, you found that piece that filled that hole, right? You didn't know what you were doing. And then all of a sudden that changed, right? And it's like you were chasing the money. But once you start stop chasing the money and find a problem that you can solve, the money starts chasing you, right? Yeah. And it's not that because people people can flip flip real estate and that could be their thing. That's the problem they're trying to solve. That just wasn't my solution or the problem that I wanted to solve for the world. That wasn't bringing me the internal fulfillment. And so it was about money. And it's exactly what you said. If you're chasing money, that's not, that's not going to give you the results you want. You mm-hmm. should be trying to solve problems and bring value to people. Yes. And then the money follows. And then here also is what happens is you feel for more fulfillment. So you want to keep doing it. You never retire if you love what you're doing. Correct. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So let's talk about, um, can you share maybe what are three of the biggest money leaks that people have and how they can avoid them? Yes. It's great. Because so. our, our goal at Big Life Financial is to start there. Okay. What is leaving you unnecessarily? Because too often people are looking for financial solutions outside of themselves when if they turn internally, they can find a lot more money that they didn't know was existing. So the first biggest financial leak that we see is unconscious spending. And the reason unconscious spending is the biggest leak is because of a principle called Parkinson's law. And if you're not familiar with that, it's not a financial principle. It's just, if there's space, you're going to fill the space with something. So for example, if you give yourself three hours to complete a project, you're going to take the full three hours to complete the project because you have the space to fill it. If you gave yourself two hours to complete the same project, you're going to do it in two hours. Obviously there's some parameters around that. Like some projects are going to take longer. But you can refine how much time you're giving yourself and you're going to fill the space to meet that, t- that time. And so what happens is people will increase their income over time. Like if I asked like 95% of people 10 years ago, how much were you making? I can almost guarantee that almost every single person would say I'm making more money today than I was 10 years ago, but they are likely in the exact same spot as they were 10 years ago financially. And it's because they increased their income but their expenses rose right with it. So they're on the same exact treadmill and nothing has changed. And so that's unconsciously occurring in their spending habits. And so 
unconscious spending is the first money leak that you have to solve, at least in our opinion, because it doesn't matter how much money we can save you or how much money you increase your income by. If you're not controlling for unconscious spending, you're likely going to be in a similar spot with more income. And so the way that we control that is we add automations and systems in the way that money flows. So you create a reservoir like money or like just like with water, you have reservoirs that the river runs through that captures excess so that when there are droughts or or just times of need, you have the reservoir of large amounts of water to go get and need as needed. So we can do that by creating automations through our finances. So money leak number one is unconscious spending and it can be stopped through automation. Okay. I mean, wow, (laughs) that is pretty impressive. Money leak number two, specifically for higher income earning individuals and even lower income, but typically as business owners are getting going, it takes some time before they start paying taxes. But when the taxes start coming, they start coming heavy and often because you've reached a point where you don't have expenses to write things off anymore. And it's just where it feels like every dollar you make, you're paying 30 to 40 to depending on some states, 50-ish percent of your income. And it feels like you're in the exact same spot you were when you were making 200000 because so much more of it is going to the government. Yes. And so the way that you can approach taxes is you just have to, to think that if I am proactive, if I start approaching my tax planning in July, August, September, when I come around next year, I'm going to have way more money than I would have. If you t- approach tax planning as a last minute thing or a December thing, you're going to pay more taxes than you need to. And, it's, and it can be tens of thousands. And in some individuals' cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars in unnecessary payments to the government that should have been yours had you been proactive, but because you weren't, you had to spend, you had to, you have to pay your taxes because you didn't put the things in place that allowed you and enabled you to keep it. Okay. I'm writing these ones down. <laughs> wow. The third Thank- money leak that we see is not being strategic around debt repayment, specifically for business owners that have either large, like when you practice loans or large like SBA loans or just business loans okay. and then student loans. So some of our clients have both of those. So they're, they're, they come in the medical industry, they have practice debt and they have student loans on top of it. And so they just approach it the way they would any other loan, which is fine because that's how we're taught. But with those two loans specifically, you can strategically play it so that you can keep more of the interest that you were supposed to pay. So you can save money over the life of the loan and oftentimes it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that would have gone to the loan, but you get to keep instead. And so those are the three big money leaks, but that's lots of money that you're able to capture. But if you haven't solved the unconscious spending piece, it's likely that you're going to save those dollars and transition them to another expense instead of save those dollars and transition them towards wealth. Wow. I am underlining that. I guarantee you I do unconscious spending. I actually went through... Um, my Apple or my apps and stuff on my phone the other day and realized I have all sorts of stuff on there that I'm paying for that I don't even use. So I probably saved $200, uh, in, in apps that, that I never really use anyway. So that unconscious spending, and then you forget, right? You forget about those reoccurring, um, expenses that, that, you know, just continue to happen that you may or may not need. So I absolutely love that. Love it. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think people get like really judgmental about people that win the lottery. Like, why can't they keep the money? Like, what's going on? But it's because there's so much of it and they're just expanding their lifestyle because they think they can expand it to this huge mean, but they're expanding it all the way to the amount of money that they have. And it just is occurring without them really thinking about it. And then all of a sudden they don't have the lifestyle. They've created this massive lifestyle unconsciously that they can't sustain. And so that's what's happening in the same same exact principle, it's just you don't have millions of dollars that you're working with. It's just you've got a raise and you just expand your lifestyle to meet that raise. So if you can control it, the conscious decision that we want internally is to build wealth and leave a lasting impact and to create a life that we love. But if we're not thinking about it, it's just going to happen naturally. Wow. Okay. So we we're talking about taxes. So like, what are some tax strategies that business owners can do or can use to save more money and grow their wealth? I mean, you already talked about, um, you know, being proactive about your your tax prep and, and making sure that, you know, you are prepared so that, you know, obviously you can pay less than, than, you know, what you might pay if you weren't prepared. But are there any other tax strategies that business owners can can use? 
Yes. I, we, we put them into three categories and mm-hmm. almost like frameworks. So there's going to be a chunk of strategies within framework one and two and three. So framework one is what we call the foundation. So the foundation is things like making sure that you're maximizing and keeping track of your miles that you're driving, making sure that you're writing off your technology, making sure you're taking things like the home office deduction, making, thing, making sure that if you have children and you're strategically finding ways to pay them through the business so you could make that a deduction, and you're turning a, a deduction into a very tax efficient means of getting money to your children and paying for things your children are doing, making sure you're using things like the Augusta rule where you're renting out and taking advantage of, you can rent out your home for 14 days a year and not have to pay income tax on it. And so you can have your business, you can rent it out to your business and do all sorts of cool things there. We call those things the foundation. And the foundation things in our mind are what accountants should be really good at. Now, not all of the accountants are great at all of those things I just mentioned, but Mm -hmm. a great accountant is really good at all of those things. Like they can cover those. That's like just a part of their overall process. Okay. Wow. Because what happens after that is that only takes you so far. And most accountants stop there. It doesn't mean they're a bad accountant. It just means that they've reached their maximum ceiling for time and energy and ability to bring value in that situation. So once that is fulfilled and you've brought your tax as low as you can with those foundational things, you then can add things, what we call tax smart investments. If you look at anything in the tax code, the government is incentivizing social behavior. So they want us to do things. If they want us to do something, they will add a tax incentive to it. So for example, they want us to be married. And if you notice single people, their tax brackets hit a lot earlier when they're getting to the 30% tax bracket right at around like 170,000, 190,000. Yeah. But married people, it's not to like 150 or 350. So it's almost double what the single person is. So the incentive is, is if you get married, you have a better tax situation. So you can look for what does the government want to incentivize? An easy one is real estate is one that people really resonate with and really know about and can connect with. So if I invest into a real estate property, I can depreciate and receive deductions for doing that simultaneously. I get the money on the income of the property and I also get some tax breaks with it. And you can enhance tax breaks with some things like cost segregation studies and things like that. But that's not the point of this, what I'm talking about here. The point is, is if you can identify as an investor, as a business owner, What is it the government is incentivizing me to invest into? Real estate is one, energy is one, agriculture is one. They will give you very good tax deductions, tax credits at times for investing into specific industries that they want us to invest in. So energy is a big issue right now. Like the United States, the world is at an energy deficit. So we consume more energy than we create. Okay. And so there has to be more solutions. And then there, there's a big push for green energy. So there's not only green energy, because like even you can get tax deductions like in oil as well, but like they're wanting you, like they're, the reason they give you a tax deduction for oil is they want the oil companies to create cleaner ways to pull the oil out of the ground and to make it cleaner. So you have to put money into companies in order to have that solution. So if you invest in those companies, the government will give you a tax break. So now the only thing to realize here is too often people, again, look to other assets before they look to themselves. So you need to realize that every investment is only as good as the person investing in it. So if you don't understand something, and you don't invest in it. So if you don't understand real estate, don't just go invest in real estate because you're getting a tax break. You invest, you become a good investor, and then you do that and the tax breaks an added benefit to it. But you hey, can't people, decide. you got to remi- you got to rewind that because what he just said, you you need to listen to it again because that absolutely resonates. Absolutely resonates. Sorry, please keep going. Yeah, yeah. The investor is what makes an investment, not the investment. Too often, people are chasing money. Again, it goes back to our original conversation. They're chasing. Oh, that's a great return. I'm just going to go over here, but they have no idea how that investment works. They don't know the risk. They don't know what's going to happen if X, Y, Z occurs. And they're just chasing the rate of return, or in our case, we're talking about they're chasing a tax break. Never chase tax breaks, never chase rates of return. Once you become a good investor, then the added benefit is you get the tax break or you get the rate of return because you understand what's happening. Okay. The last bucket that we look to do is can we create a tax arbitrage? So can we create something where we put a dollar into it and it's going to spit out a dollar fifty or a two dollar or two dollar and ten cent? tax break. So I'm going to save more money than I put into it. 
So we can do this through donations. We can do this through some insurance strategies where we can start to create tax arbitrages where I'm putting I'm putting dollars in where I have to spend money, but on the backside, I'm going to save $1.50. So I'm plus $1.50, even though I gave a dollar. So I'm 50 cents ahead. Um, um, so my cash flow is better. I get to keep that dollar instead of it going to the government. So that's the last area where we can look to it. Now, there's a lot to that area. The specifics should be handled in a one-to-one -one conversation, but know that those things exist because once you know they exist, you can find them and you can seek them out. You, until you know they exist, people don't even realize you could put a dollar into something and save $2 in taxes. Once you know it exists, you can go get it and find it and make it happen for yourself. Okay. And so if somebody wanted to come and talk to you, where can yeah. they find you? Yeah. The easiest way is to go to biglifefinancial.com. I also have a YouTube channel, Justin B. Maxwell. You can search it there. I have content there. And then I'm on LinkedIn as well. Those are the three ways that you can find me and communicate with me or my team. And we can uh, help you access those tax strategies and be a part of your tax planning journey. But again, we can save you all this money, but if you haven't solved the unconscious spending piece, it's unlikely that you're going to actually have this transfer to anything that will become substantial. Our goal is to help you take the 50000 of tax savings and shift it towards wealth building, either back into the business or into other things that produce more wealth for you. So we can accelerate your wealth growing process. But if you haven't solved unconscious spending, it's going to disappear into another expense. <laughs> okay. Now I have some interesting questions for you. Um, so how do you measure human life value and what role does it play in creating and protecting? Wealth? I think this answer is going to be different for us than it would be the normal person. Human life value in our mind is not just your maximum financial potential. Human life value is a combination of your maximum financial potential. It's the, it's the combination of your maximum experience potential. It's the combination of your maximum relationship potential. It's the combination of your maximum health potential. And it's the combination of your maximum faith potential. The integration of all three makes up your human life value. Is what happens with a lot of people is, at least people in the entrepreneurial world that I see, is they focus so much on maximizing their financial potential that they destroy their experiences, they destroy their relationships, they destroy their health, and they destroy their faith. But they're really high in finance, but they haven't actually lived a human a maximum human life value. The reality is, is the financial piece is absolutely the least important of that. But you need the financial piece to maximize the experiences and the relationships and the health. Because if you ignore the financial piece, those things can't be maximized. They all have a ceiling because you have to spend money to experience things at a deeper level. You have to spend money to go on dates oftentimes. You have to spend money to go on vacations with your spouse, which deepen the relationship. So if you haven't solved the financial piece and you're ignoring it, you can't maximize those. So we have to do all of them together, even though the finances is the least important. So we want to create a system that gets finances maximized to a point that we don't have to focus entirely on that. And we can focus on all the other areas so that we can live the richest and best life that we possibly can. Oh my gosh. I think you just created a TikTok for me. <laughs> um, okay. So what is the difference between a product and a strategy, and how well, does it affect your financial certainty? Yeah, a product is a thing like a mutual fund or a life insurance or a 401k or a 15-year mortgage or a 30-year mortgage. And the problem, that's not a problem, but one of the issues that people have financially is that each of those things I just mentioned, plus a variety of more, all have individual salespeople that are selling just that product. And it's not saying those people are bad, it's just that if you put a product without a strategy, you're probably going to be disappointed in it. And you're not going to find fulfillment with it. So if you start with the strategy, meaning what is the overall goal that I want to accomplish? Is it speed? Is it keeping money? Is it creating a legacy? Is it doing X, Y, Z? Then I can plug the products into the strategy. And oftentimes there's going to be multiple answers for what product to plug in, but you're going to plug the product in that sits best with that individual's needs and desires and what they're looking for and what makes it most efficient. So we approach things from a strategy perspective versus a product perspective. We want, we, we, we sell products, but we want to plug in the strategy first and then apply the product to the strategy that's going to maximize that strategy forward. An example, because I don't think that is very clear for a lot of people, with student loans, we can use government programs to reduce their monthly payment. We can take what their payment was going to be, and we can get it growing for them 
when we reach the end of the student loan program that the government provides, I haven't paid off my student loan, but the benefit of the student loan program is that it gets forgiven. When they forgive my loan, I have to pay taxes on it. But because I've been paying myself the entire time and it's been growing for me the entire time, I have plenty of money to pay the tax and I still have a lot of money left over. That's a strategy. So we're trying to find strategies and then we're going to put a product in there that's going to give us what we're looking for that's going to accomplish the task that we needed to accomplish. Wow. I mean, I had no idea that any of this was available. I mean, fantastic stuff you guys do. Talk about innovative. Like this is exactly what this podcast is for, is to show innovative ideas that can solve problems. That's exactly what you're doing. And I freaking love it. Absolutely love it. Um, so another question for you. Does somebody have to have like a certain financial portfolio in order to work for you or work with you or like what are your who are your common clients i guess so we're going to work best with someone that's an entrepreneur or a business owner because we're business owners and we're entrepreneurs and we know and can relate with what they're going through so that's who we can work best with but we can start we can work with a business owner that's fresh out of school that just barely got started their practice or started their business, they have massive loans, they're still working through a lot of things. And we can start strategically strategizing around how can we help you keep more of your money, not so you can invest in outside things, but so that you can make this your primary investment first. Again, people chase outside things first without focusing on what's going to make them more money over the long haul. Your business, you yourself will make more money through your business than any investment you'll ever invest in. Obviously, there's going to be unicorns and random people that invest in an XYZ company and it blew up and they got millions and millions of dollars. But we don't want to be unicorns. We want to work on probability. The probability is that your business is going to make you more money than anything outside of yourself. So you get your business right first and then you choose to invest and start to become a good investor in other things once your business is flowing and strategic. So we can help you accomplish that and we're not going to drive you into other investments until you're ready. But we can get you creating efficiencies on the front end first, and then we'll take you the rest of the way if you wish. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so I ask everybody this question. Who do you think is the most innovative entrepreneur in American history? Yeah, I thought about this for a long time. Um, I think for me, the way I approach things is I hate superlatives. And so to me, it's who has affected me the most right now because my future self, I might give a different answer because I've created a bigger future. So for me, it's actually someone that's living right now. And you probably, most people probably don't know who it is. It's just someone that's impacted me with their entrepreneurial delivery and what value they put out in the world and who they've connected with. And that person's name is Michael Port. So Michael Port, as he wrote a book called Book Yourself Solid. He's created public speaking. So they're really amazing public speaking. But the way in the way that he approaches it has inspired me and helped enhance my vision. So he wasn't the person I heard speak first that gave me the initial vision, but he's given me clarity around how to get to that vision and how to make it a possibility. So for me, that's the person. Um, and I know most people probably have no idea who he is because he's not like doesn't matter. Not it's like uh, my famous, but he's still a, he's still an extraordinary entrepreneur himself. So that's that's yeah. me. I love it. I love it. I actually had somebody answer saying it was her mom. So my, you know, who is impacting you? That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, again, why don't you tell us where our listeners can find you? Yep. So the easiest way is to go to probably LinkedIn. Um, another way that you could do it is you can connect right to my calendar on www.biglifefinancial/trp, and it will take you to my calendar, and we can have a free consultation and just see. Can we help you? Yes or no. And then if I can't, is I do want to bring value to you. I do know lots of people that I probably can connect you to that wouldn't be us. Justin, I have really enjoyed this conversation and I'm thankful that you came and shared this with us because I don't, I mean, I didn't know it existed. So I'm really glad that this information has been out, gotten out there. And I truly hope more people take advantage of um, your innovative ideas. So Thank you very much, Justin, for joining us today on our Innovative Entrepreneurs podcast. And I look forward to talking to you again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Erica. Wow. What a great episode. I hope you had as much fun as I did. 
If you want more of this goodness, make sure you subscribe so that you get notifications for future podcasts. And if you found value from this, please share it with others. You can visit our website at cwgdigital.com. This is Erica Bailey. I am your host, and I will see you next time.